And now to our speaker and his presentation, an overview of Shane and Methods. Robert Lloyd, president of Lloyd Consulting Group, is a Stanford-trained innovator and change agent passionate about successfully deploying and leading strategic initiatives. His focus has been in customer-centered design, operational excellence, and agile development across consumer products and many sectors on an international basis with an impact of over $2 billion. At Motorola, Bob was trained in Shannon Method directly by Dorian Shannon and Keke Bote. This approach was used by Motorola to improve product reliability sixfold continuing to drive reliability to 1 million hours mean time between failures. This allowed Motorola to beat all five of its Japanese competitors in cost, quality, performance, and on-time delivery to become the largest seller of radios in Japan. As Motorola Director of Product Reliability, Bob used Shannon design of experiments methods to design a test that reduced product time to market by over two and a half months identified three times more correlated field issues, eliminated costly engineering change orders, and slashed field failures and warranty costs by more than half. This test was institutionalized across Motorola for an impact exceeding $1 billion. At an ASQ World Conference, Bob presented field failure analysis and root cause pattern diagrams related to graphical data mining technique by applying the Shane and practice of looking for data patterns. About tonight's presentation, an overview of Shane and methods. Shane and methods, also known as statistical engineering and Shane and systems, is a problem solving approach championed by Dorian Shannon, formerly VP and executive secretary of ASQ in the 50s and 70s, and first winner of all four top ASQ medals. Shane and methods is based on deductive reasoning, unlike Six Sigma, that uses inductive approach. It is structured as a direct and simpler approach to identifying root causes and their solutions. As a standard problem-solving approach, its main principles are to use convergent techniques to quickly narrow the focus, use simple comparison tools to quickly identify root causes, not rely on the use of heavy statistical software and training, allow use by employees at all levels, including the front line, and needs relatively smaller sample sizes, which makes it applicable to more firms. The Shannon Methods approach has been used heavily in the automotive and aircraft industries, but is applicable everywhere. Although older than Six Sigma, it is less known due to highly stringent non-disclosure agreements restricting dissemination in and outside of co companies. And now, Join me in welcoming Bob Lloyd. All right, so so this is an overview, and I want to stress that because it's trying to say, how about teaching me Six Sigma in, in like uh, 50 minutes, okay? So we're going to kind of go through this fairly quick. I'm not going to go really deep. Uh, quick thing on Dorian Shannon. As uh, Phil mentioned, uh, uh, I'm going to have to advance over here. Okay. Uh, yeah, he was uh, one of the ASQ founders, became ASQ fellow in 49, executive secretary, first winner of, uh, winner of the four medals. Uh, he's had an ASQ medal named after him in 2004. Uh, he was lead reliability consultant for the NASA lunar lander. So when you saw Apollo 13 and the reliability of the lunar lander, just think of Dorian. Uh, he was creator of lot plot statistical methods that was really big in the war efforts back in the 40s. Uh, and he's famous for his comment, talk to the parts, they are smarter than the engineers. Okay. Uh, so in addition to Keki, uh, to uh, Dorian, I also got to mention Keki Boat because Keki worked at Motorola uh, with Dorian. So uh, we, you, you never saw one without the other. They were always going through the company together. And, and like I said, I was trained by both of them. And uh, uh Thanks to, to Keki is the reason why it's kind of busted out of the non-disclosure on, on Shannon, because uh, Keki was always asking Dorian, hey, why don't you write a book on this stuff? And, and Dorian says, I'm too busy. He goes, why don't you write it? So, so Keki wrote the book World Class Quality, and Dorian even wrote the foreword for the book, okay? And so, so much of the information, this entire presentation is based on the stuff that, that, that Keki put out in World Class Quality. Uh, there's, there's two versions of it. The 1991, don't buy that. It's full of errors. If you're going to buy the book by the 2000 second edition, which is 512 pages long, you can get it at Amazon. It's like $24 new or, or hardcover or softcover. 
Uh, the other resources is uh, the statistical engineering, which is ASQ Press. And that's written by two professors who, who I met when I was working for BlackBerry. Uh, I, I created an online web-based training in Six Sigma, I'm sorry, in Six Sigma, Lean, and also Shane and Methods for BlackBerry uh, for their headquarters up in Waterloo. And I actually conversed with the professors writing the book. Um, that one's a little steep, $920 new, $491 used. And the other book is uh, from another friend of mine, from Greg Young, uh, back with Reasoning Backwards. Uh, it's, it's, it's basically almost like Techie's book, uh, but that's no longer available on Amazon, but you can get it directly from, uh, from uh, Greg at youngassociatesinc.com. And that's around $24.95. So uh, those are resources that you can, you can go to, okay? Uh, this presentation, a presentation space, that it's intended only as an overview of the Shane and Methods uh, in order to familiarize you guys with the tools and the practices. Uh, and and uh, due to the time, time constraint, we're not gonna be able to go into a lot of detail on these things, okay? So if there is interest uh, in, in Shane and you can either refer to those reference materials I talked to, uh, you can contact Shane and Red X Holding, uh, but remember there's non-disclosure agreements that, that you'll be subject to with them. Uh, or you can contact me. Uh, so just to get the legal part out of it with Shane and uh, things is uh, all materials uh, covered in this book, uh, in this presentation is limited to the material publicly disclosed and world-class quality by Keki and Ade Bote. Uh, the following terms are registered trademarks and service marks of Red X Holdings, LLC. Uh, green Y, Red X, Pink X, Pale Pink X, B versus C, Component Search, Paired Comparison, Tolerance, Parallelogram, Variable search, uh, Bob, which is best of best, and Wow, which is worst of worst. And lastly, Lloyd Consulting Group is not affiliated with the Shane and Red X Holding LLC. So now that I've got the legal stuff out of the way, let's let's get into uh, Shane and. Uh, so the benefits of of Shane and methods, uh, uh, there's a number of them. It's it, the the best thing is it's simple but a very powerful uh, methods and tools. So uh, they they have very uh, strong convergent techniques that quickly narrow your focus. Uh, it's a standardized approach to problem solving. So it's a standardized method, kind of like Six Sigma, although it isn't. Uh, simple comparison tools. They don't use a lot of heavy statistics. Uh, you don't use heavy statistical software uh, or heavy training. And that's because it's designed to be used by all people in the company, even the frontline workers. And, uh, and the nice thing is, depending on what type of company you're in, it uses relatively small sample sizes. So if you're dealing with a low volume production, Shannon might be the best thing for you. On the right hand side of the screen is a comparison of classical Taguchi and Shannon DOE methods uh, presented by Keki in, in his book. Uh, Keki has a tendency to go more towards the hyperbole, so he might exaggerate some of this stuff. But there's a quick comparison of, of, the, uh, of the methods, and this is on, on the DOE. Um, so looking at a comparison. So uh, on the intro, I had it backwards. So, so Six Sigma is more of an inductive uh, approach where you develop a theory and a hypothesis. You do observation, you get confirmation. So you come up with a hypothesis, you run a test, you see if your p-values are in the right you know, levels. Uh, and also, if you go and look at, on the right-hand side, I, I use an example, which is called, why is the professor dead? And if you go into a, a, a Ishikawa diagram, a cause and effect diagram, you might be saying, okay, what, what could be the causes? It could be a student, a lover, a wife, a colleague, uh, suicide, overdose, accident, crime. And then you could break down, I, I, I simplified it, but you could have various uh, number of things within those, okay? Um, Dorian did not believe in any of that. Dor Dorian thought that coming up with cause and effect diagrams was uh, akin to guessing and, and wasting time going on wild goose chases on things that really had no effect, okay? So trying to think of all the different things that could be the possibilities he considered was a waste of time. And that's why he's famous for his comment, talk to the parts, they are smarter than the engineers. Uh, Dorian believed in uh, deductive reasoning. And deductive, this is why my friend Greg Young has this book like Sherlock Holmes. If you ever watch Sherlock's home, he does deductive reasoning. And that is because he focuses on the evidence first. So what does the body tell us? What does the scene tell us? What do the pat time patterns tell us? You collect all of this wealth of information prior to forming any type of hypothesis. Okay, so once you've collected the information and looked for patterns, 
Now it's time to come up with a tentative hypothesis and theory and go and try to prove that, okay? Uh, so uh, the basic chain and fundamentals is uh, the green Y is what you're trying to solve from. And if you think of a you know, six sigma, it's F of X, you know, so the green Y is a function of the red X, which is your, it gets into Pareto uh, and, and uh, you get a function of your pink X and your pale pink X. Uh, Dorian was close friends with uh, Duran, okay? And both of them were really pushing uh, uh, Pareto, Pareto uh, uh, methods. Uh, so the green Y is the primary output parameter that you're trying to solve for, okay? And the red X is the primary input parameter that impacts the green Y. And often it acts alone, it's a primary effect. Uh, a pink X is a secondary input parameter uh, that impacts the green Y. And often it, it, it's, one, it's an interactive effect. And a pale pink X is an even weaker version of the pink X, okay? Uh, so one of the things that you really would start off in, on Shannon is, is to do an is, is not comparative analysis. And some of these tools are shared with Six Sigma, okay? But, uh, but using an is, is not comparative, it works help to help find that information, the patterns and stuff. So here you're looking at what is and what is not. So here the speaker does not alert, but the light and the vibe are still working. Okay, so you're trying to say what, what is and what isn't, okay? And then you're also looking at uh, who, what, where, and when. Uh, so, so if you're trying to put a problem statement together, looking at this, you'd say, uh, why do the speakers, looking at the top, not alert on products manufactured during the third shift at manufacturing site A after July 30th? So, so pulling all the information together in order to try to isolate it. Remember, Shannon believes in, in quick uh, you know, trying to, to get to the matter and, and exclude things that are not involved. So that's why we're looking at this. So we're not looking at, at shifts one and sec two. We're not looking at stuff before July 30th. We're not looking at manufacturing site B. And, you know, so, so it's a way for us to, to narrow the focus. Uh, so, uh, so looking at defining the green Y, defining the green Y and also doing a, a measurement analysis is, is very similar to the Six Sigma. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it is very similar uh, to, to the, the Six Sigma. So one of the questions is the problem been clearly stated. If you can't state it in a single sentence or a short paragraph, then you haven't got to the point yet. So you need to narrow it down. Uh, has it been defined and quantified? So, so put specific. So if it's a failure rate of such and such, at such value. So you want to get like failure rates or, or some quantified value of, of, of defining what the problem is. Uh, if you're dealing with an attribute, which is a yes or no, let's say you're talking about I have cosmetic damage on the product. Well, if you say, does it have cosmetic dam damage, yes or no, you can't do much with that. So, so you basically transform it into artificial variables. So you can look at the cosmetic damage and you can put it on a scale where one is no damage, then you have two few uh, minor, uh, three many minor, four few severe, five ma many severe. So take a take a, a pair, uh, attribute and, and convert it into more of a, a variable data because you want to deal with variable data. It tell, uh, tells you a lot more. Uh, is there more than one green wine? So so is there two things happening? So you want to identify that. Uh, is there an earlier or easier associated green wine? At Mode Roller, I was head of product reliability, and we had uh, chargers that were catching fire in the in the field. But one of the things we noticed is that, that uh, all of them had blown SOTs uh, transistors. So if we could find out uh, which ones you know might have blown SOTs or something which occurs earlier, it might be easier to solve the problem. And and again, we're trying to move it upstream as far as possible. Uh, measurement system same same MSA is pretty much the same as Six Sigma. Uh, within instrument variation, instrument to instrument, and operator to operator, typical ANOVA, uh, except except uh, that, that's probably the one area where we might get into some statistical analysis. Uh, and they look at the uh, capability of the measurement systems. Uh, Shannon used the five to one rule. So if you look at a spec of five ohm plus or minus 10%, uh, the 10% would be 0 0.5 ohm. And on a five to one rule, you'd, you'd want to have nothing which is, is, is you need to be a 0.1 ohm or smaller in order to have the proper resolution to do measurements. So I want to get that out of the way because I want to focus on what's the true 
Shane and methods, and that's bringing into the Shane and tool set. And what Shannon believes in is that anything that frontline workers can, can apply. So you're looking at these early clue generating tools, and those are multi-vary charts, component search, concentration charts, paired comparison, and so, uh, which would take anywhere from 220 to 1,000 variables and try to knock it down. And you're trying to knock it down to less than 20. So in this case, when we get into the root cause analysis, we're looking at a variable search that would run like five to 20 variables. Uh, hopefully, if you can get it down to four or less, you've run a full uh, factorial DOE. Shannon did not believe in fractional factorial because he was concerned that there was too much of a confounding effect in there. And it's much too, I mean, I, I even know a lot of uh, black belts, even master black belts, when you get into uh, fractional factorials, or well, which level of fractional factorial, it really gets complicated really fast. So, so Dorian said, you know, to hell with fractional factorial, only use the full factorials and use these other tools in order to get yourself down to four or less, okay? Uh, so, so maybe you do the variable search and get yourself down to a small enough that you can then put into a full factorial. Uh, the bottom line is you wanna feed these things to try to narrow it down uh, to a single variable or, or a group, if it's a it's interactive effect or a group of variables, where you can do a B versus C comparison. To, to validate it. And then from there we go into improvement and the two main improvement tools uh, for Shannon is if there's no interactive effects, you use a tolerance parallelogram. And if there are interactive effects, you use response surface methods, but not the complicated with your ones you see on statistical software. This is very simple surface response methods that frontline workers could use. Uh, they have other stuff on control, which is assurance on positrol and process certification which I'm not gonna go into tonight. Uh, but if there is enough time, I will get into pre-control, which is a simplified uh, method much simpler than control charting. <coughs> so the power of convergence. Uh, Shannon believed on, hey, let's narrow the thing and get rid of the things that have nothing to do uh, with the problem. So I like using this as an example of convergence. So you have 81 balls and one of them is heavier than the others. And you're trying to figure out what's the fastest way I can get, find that one ball out of the 81. So, so the first thing you do is he breaks it into, into three groups. And uh, you put one third off the balance beam and one third on each side of the balance beam. And if it's balanced, then obviously the heavy ball isn't in here or else it would be down on one side. So the heavy ball has to be in this group. So you just eliminated two thirds of your population. Uh, so we take that group and we subdivide that into three, put it on the balance beam again. And this time when we look, we find out, oh, guess what? You know, these two aren't, it, it, it's actually, it's in this group of, of uh, uh, balls. So again, we just eliminated two thirds of the population. We do it again, cut those into thirds, divide them out, and test and guess what these are balanced so it's in this group over here uh we break we break this that into that and we run the test again and finally goes like this so in four tests with the balance beam we got down to the one one ball that that's the heavy one each time we went through here we eliminated two-thirds of the population that's what we talk about the power of convergence narrowing it down quickly so you say well what the hell do these balls have to do with me solving problems okay well, this is the Shane and elimination flow chart. So here's a problem. Roughly 5% of displays fail during summer months in high climates. Uh, you're looking in here and you got product, measurement equipment, and measurement operator. Uh, you run your MSA and you find out, guess what? We don't have to worry about those. So we just need to focus on the product now. We take the product and now we break that down into components of the product and the assembly process. So there are methods that I will show you later on regarding assembly process that we'll test. But we run those tests and guess what? It's not has anything to do with the assembly and it's all here in the components. Uh, we run this again, break it down, display module, keypad module, motherboard. Uh, we, we go evaluate that and find out it had nothing to do with those other, other modules. And, and we'll, we'll see this when we get into the, uh, the testing that we'll be doing after this. So that brings us down to display module. And you have display glass, driver, and connector. Uh, you do evaluation there again, and you eliminate those two into the display driver. And you break that down again. And here's your main turning AFC, IC warpage, and ESD. You do that, and you can eliminate this, but guess what? You got these two here. So uh, 
guess what? If there's an interactive effect caused between the uh, interaction between the anitropic conductive film and the degree of IC warpage aggravated by the, by the hot temperatures and stuff like that. So, so bottom line is you see how quickly we eliminated all these things that had nothing to do with the problem. Uh, so let's go into uh, the first round of early clue generating tools, and that is the multivariate analysis. Uh, so here we're looking at the manufacture of IC wafers. So uh, you have, we're taking three samples at nine o'clock, at 10 o'clock, one o'clock, and 3 p.m. Uh, and we're doing testing five different locations on each one of the wafers. So in here, uh, we're looking uh, for, for part to part, okay? Uh, we're looking from time to time, so you're temporal, and here you're looking within part, okay? So let's, so this is, this is how we're setting it up, but let's see how we'd run this on a chart. On a chart, Here's what your wafer looks like. And we have a symbol for each one of these locations, okay? So when we do this, this is the value where that line might be with the values from uh, point, this may be this like around 0.78 to 0.9 millimeters. Uh, so, so you're looking at the, the, the wafer thickness. So this would tell you which, what the thickness is at each one of these locations by these shapes, okay? Uh, so, so here's the three samples taken at nine o'clock, the three samples taken at 11, the three taken at one and the three taken at 3 p.m. Okay, and uh, we can, uh, so, so here you're gonna take the, what's the average of each one of these readings for the wafer? And the other thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take what's the average of the group of three? Okay, so the time average for the group of three taken at this time, what's the average during that time? So uh, we'll get rid of that so we can focus on the chart. So. What Shannon does, a lot of Shannon is, is graphical. And, and uh, so what we look at here, and you can do this mathematically as well, but we're looking at what is the total value that, uh, variation from the very lowest value that we, we took, which was at the three o'clock reading, to the very highest one that we had, which was at the one o'clock reading, okay? And what is the total variance from this level to that level? And this is the total variation. And then we take a look and say, uh, looking time to time. So uh, uh, looking at these, uh, what was the lowest time average? So of, of these these red uh, diamonds, with, uh, sorry, red uh, print, uh, uh, triangles with the white centers, which is the lowest one out of all of these and what is the highest one out of all of these? So the biggest spread from the lowest to the highest uh, were, were these two. And you look at what's the height from here to here and you put that alongside here and the height of that one was 60% of the total variation, which tells you that the variation percentage is 60%. Likewise, within parts. So you, out of all of these individual parts, which one had the largest spread? So it was this one right here. You find out what that distance is. That's over here. And that was 41% of the overall variation. And this one here is part to part. So looking at all of these, which one had the, the widest variation from the low to the high of the three parts? And it was in this grouping here. And so that was a 10%. So that was a 10%. So you're looking at the contributions in here. So here's your red X, your pink X, and your pale pink X. And now you can look in here and say, what's the variation cause for your time to time? And you're looking at the buffing pad, where is abrasive too quickly? And you have your corrective action. Uh, for within part, part, a wafer does not perfectly flat due to buildup on fixture. And we didn't know what the reason for part to part is. Uh, but basically, you, you, can, you can break it down by looking at the patterns in the data. What is the data telling us? Okay. Uh, another uh, early clue generation is what they call component search. Uh, and, and this is for products that can be disassembled. And so if you can break the, part, the, the uh, product apart, uh, you look at your initial values. We're looking at... Uh, 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 these were resistant values, uh, no, uh, voltage values that we had on here. And initially, uh, all components from the best, this, you, you, this is where we took the best group. You grab like around uh, a handful of like five to six of your best values and uh, th the same thing of your worst values. And you go through these, this com uh, comparison here. So you're looking at this uh, comparison, the best initial value, and it was 61 millivolts and the comparison of the worst initial values, that was uh, five millivolts. And uh, 
we disassemble it and we reassemble it to see if anything has happened. And it changed a little bit, but it's, it was still past, uh, it was in the acceptable range. This was still in the, uh, this was still in the reject range. You disassemble it, reassemble it again. And guess what? This still works and this one still fails. So, so you said assembly and disassembly is not important. Now we go in and we start looking at changing parts one at a time. So these R is referred to rest of components. So, uh, so here's the, all the rest of the bad, uh, uh, no, uh, yeah, the rest of the best, okay? And uh, so R is rest, B is best. So rest of the uh, best. And we're bringing the worst A over to here and we're taking the best A and moving it over here. So we swapped the good and the bad A. And when we did that, guess what? These still passed, these still failed, A is unimportant. We did the things, same thing with part B. We swapped them, guess what? This one still was good, this one still was bad, B's unimportant. We get to C, and uh, let's, let me get over to here, yeah. We get to C, and when we swap them, we find out that the, uh, uh, the good one now fails. But it's still not the full thing because the, the good part put in the bad part didn't make the bad one pass, okay? So there must be something else besides that one part. So we keep on going down. And remember, when we swap these things, after we do the swap, we put them back afterwards, okay? It's not cumulative. We do the change and then we return them because we're only trying to find, we're trying to isolate the impact of each one of these values. So we then check D and see how D works. And that was unimportant. E was unimportant. We get to F and F operated like C. Uh, when, when you put the good one in the bad, uh, it still it still didn't work, but when you put the bad the the bad one into the uh, in the good one, it failed. Uh, so uh, we keep on going. We try the next one, which is a seven for part G, and that was unimportant. So we found C and we found F. Uh, C and F, although they didn't make the bad one good, they did make the good one bad. So now what you do is what's called a capping run. You take the two uh, that we found up here and you swap those. So when we swap the uh, C and the F, the good ones, into the bad part, guess what? It makes the bad one now work. And put the bad ones in this one, it fails. So since these two makes the bad one work, it confirms that C and F are the two items that, that, you, that are important for, for how this thing works. Uh, so, so you identify that. So this is how it's graphically shown on, on this chart. So you want the, if, if I ran the capping run and this didn't work, that means there was something else going on that you need to investigate, okay? Uh, so the other thing they use is concentration charts. And concentration charts are very simple. Uh, you're looking for uh, geographic or, or, or uh, locations. Uh, so here, if you're looking at a product, you might see a, 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 a commonly known as a measle chart. I used to do this at Motorola. We'd have our board layout and I'd take red dots and whenever we had failures, I'd put the red dots where the failures occur. And guess what? If you had a whole concentration of failures in this area, that tells you that either your thermals or electrostatic discharge or maybe G forces in that area are high. So, but it tells you that you have an issue related to that area. Kind of eliminates everything else and focuses you on this area. Likewise, if you're looking at cosmetic damage, you might have it on, uh, on the edges here. Uh, and, but nowhere else. So that tells you where you need to focus your attention. Uh, you could be also temperature profile during burn-in. On uh, it, so if you found out in in the uh, in the temperature chamber where you're doing the burn-in, uh, how much does the temperature vary in that that temperature chamber? And do you have failures which occur in a specific location within the the, the, the thermal chamber? And since I was doing this for BlackBerry. Uh, we're looking at lightning strike density maps for uh, for Canada. You say, okay, where is lightning uh, more more prevalent? So if you had failures coming in from the field, and guess what? We find out that our failures were predominantly from specific areas. Maybe you have problems with with lightning strikes causing a problem. So uh, so this is just using concentration charts in various ways to try and understand how it could affect the problem. Uh, this is another method. If you cannot disassemble the product, then you use this paired comparison method. And this is where the best of the best versus the worst of the worst. You get like around six to eight good and six to eight of the best ones you can find and six to eight worst uh, ones together. And the greater the difference you can find between the good and bad readings, the better. And what you're going to do is you, you, 
it doesn't matter how you pair these, but you're looking at one versus the other. And so the first pair, uh, good had no flaws seen. The bad one had oxide, defects, chip dye, whatever. And you do this and you look at the observations. And, uh, and then six out of the uh, six bad ones uh, repeated the oxide defects. So likely the red X, four of the six bad had chip dye. You know, uh, th this seems to be a little more simplistic. Uh, the, the, the paired comparison tool that I prefer is the Tukey method. Paired comparison uh, alternative with the Tukey method. John Tukey was a, a brilliant uh, uh, professor, uh, statistician, also friends with Joran and, and uh, uh, Shannon. Tukey method does what they call the N test, N count. And on here, you had your good and your bad products, right? And you're looking at the value. So here you're looking at battery impedance and you rank order them uh, from, from, from uh, low to high, okay? And what you do is uh, when you rank order them, you see where the good and bad ones are located. So on this first one, we looked at battery impedance. Uh, all the good are here and all the bad ones are down here. So it tells you which direction is, is, is the worst one and which one's direction is better. And it also shows that there's no overlap between them. So, so it is uh, linear in it. Uh, looking at low uh, rate discharge energy, in this case, we had three bad ones down here, three good ones up here. And uh, these two had same values, 82%. These two had same values, 79%. So we split the difference on here. Everything in the middle was, was overlap, okay? Um, so these, these were together. So this gave us uh, uh, two and a half uh, value here, two and a half up here. So it gives us a score of five. <clears throat> we keep on doing that here. Here you had the good up here, bad down here. Here you had uh, a tie here. Here you had... Uh, an overlap all the way from here to here. So the good one was up here, the bad one's up here. So this had an end count of one, this had an end count of one, so a total value of two. This one was totally overlapped. It would be at the top and be at the bottom, you had a score of zero, okay? So looking at here, uh, Tukey has a way of converting end counts to confidence levels. So if you had a, a, a end count of 13, it's 99.99.9%. So, so you can convert these end counts to percentage. So this one with 12 gave us a, a confidence of 99.7. This one with 11 gave us 99.2. So here's your red X and here's your pink X. Uh, so now let's get into root cause analysis. And so here, Shane, and, like I said, did not like fractional factorial DOEs. He believed in full, you know, he wanted full factorials. And so you couldn't have uh, 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 confounding effects. So in, in this one, this is a classic where you're looking at uh, soldering operations. <coughs> so you're looking at solder paste, belt speed, stencil thickness, and reflow temperatures. And here, so those are your four factors, okay? And you get two levels, one for each, so no lead, so uh, no lead solder and an indium solder here, belt speed of one minute per uh, one meter per minute. This one's two meters per minute. Uh, different stencil thicknesses and different reflow temperatures. Okay, so the uh, factors A through D here are likewise up through here. Your uh, levels of minus and plus are down in here. And what we do is we do different combinations. This is your DOE and. Uh, and this denotes which values you put in here. So one had all of the negative, you know, of these values, uh, and 16 had all of the positive values. And there's a convention on how you put these combinations together. This is the entire 16 possible combinations for these four variables. <coughs> so looking at here, uh, and like I said, this is this is a standardized method that you, that uh, convention for the DOE tables, and you have these distributions of the pluses and the minuses. How this works is over here you have your solder defects. So this is the output, the solder defects. Now, <clears throat> this should be run in randomized order, and you should have replication. So this could be average or total outputs here. Uh, actually, probably total outputs would be best. And so what you're gonna do on here, so how does this thing work? You got these values here. So, uh, so here's uh, the four factor, which we show here, A, B, C, D, here's the four factor. So you had a value of 10 here and 106 here. Well, you had the plus and the minus here. So what happens is these signs here go together with the, v's, the values here. 
to, and you add them all up and you end up with 20. And these numbers are applied to these uh, plus and minus conventions here and give you all of these numbers in here. That's how it works. So what we're looking for is either the highest or the lowest value. It doesn't matter, you're looking at magnitude. So it doesn't matter if it's plus or minus, you're looking which is the greatest magnitude. So, so in here, uh, for this AB combination here, gave you a minus 222, and the AD gave you a minus 196. Those are the two highest values amongst here. So that basically says that you have an interactive effects uh, between A and B, the paste and the speed, that's your red X, and your pink X is between your paste and your temperature. Okay, it tells you what, what, your, what your issues are there. Okay, and, and, and the reason why, uh, oh, uh, yeah, I have to make a, you use the full factor when you have no more than four variables. Okay, uh, going on, uh, if, if there are, inter so uh, interactive effects, let me go back once. Uh, uh, this one had interactive effects, okay? If, if you did not have any interactive effects, let's say it was just a main thing, you could solve the problem. This is doing improvement. You could solve using tolerance parallelogram. A tolerance parallelogram is used when no interactive effects occur. So this is how it works. Here's your initial value of your uh, re resistor six spec, your R6 spec. And here's the value down here. So uh, this, and, and it's, this is your values. You, you take 30 samples and you look at them and this is how they're distributed. And it's like, no, that's okay. Uh, but here's your product spec limit. So here's your uh, uh, decibel output of your speaker. And it's between 50 and 60. And so this is your lower spec and your upper spec. And so here is your, your uh, resistor spec and here's the output of the speaker. So when you look at this, you say, whoa, uh, a lot of my values here are outside of the upper spec limit. So when you look at this, you, you put a regression line through this data, uh, and then you look and find which of these points is the furthest away from the uh, regression line, which is the furthest away. You find that distance, and that becomes your lower boundary, and then you put that same distance above the regression line for your upper boundary. So what happens is you look at that and you see where the upper boundary crosses your upper spec limit. So that's one part of your new spec limit of your uh, uh, resistor value. And then you look at the lower spec limit and you look at where the lower boundary crosses the lower spec limit. And that basically becomes your new spec for your R. So now it should be 120 plus or minus 10% between these values. You originally had it from here to here, but that was incorrect. It really should be specified between here and here. Now, to see what the impact is, uh, you look at the distance from the upper boundary to the, up, to the uh, upper spec limit, and you see how much X, you know, how big the X is, and you look at that total spread between the upper and lower spec limit, and here we're finding that this was a value of eight, this was a value of 10, so 80% impact uh, is due to the uh, R6 resistor. Uh, here's a different one where a uh, uh, different value where this is a tight spread. Suppose that your, your 30 units were spread much wider than that. So you will go and look at it again. Here's your X and here's your S. Uh, this was three and this was a total of 10. You're in at 30%. So it's a less impact. So the greater the, uh, the tighter the scatter, the greater the correlation and the impact confidence uh, that, that, that the R6 was an important uh, contributor to the uh, uh, decibel output but this tells you what your proper spec limit should be. Uh, so now we get into response surface methods. And this is when you have interactive effects. So when you have interactive effects, there's two things going on simultaneously. So on this one, we're looking at manufacturing yield of temperature and time settings. So we originally set this, well, our initial settings is at 620 and, uh, degrees centigrade and for 70 minutes. And we had 82% yield. Okay, and so to do uh, the response service methods, we put a, a boundary, uh, there's 620, and we go uh, 10, uh, 20 above and 20 below, and plus five and uh, minus five <clears throat> around the time. And, and this, this isn't set and hold. I mean, this was just values that we picked for doing the test. And we run the test, and we look at what the yield values are at, that, at those time and uh, temperature combinations. And we look at this, so we had 82% originally, and we look at all of those, and the best value was down here, 
So we move in that direction and we do the test again at, at these other values. We look at what the uh, yields are and the best percentage is down here at 88%. So we run the test again and we look at the values and the best one's down here at 92. And we run the test again and the best values here in the center, 95. So we set 95% as the peak as the new values of 500 degrees for 80 minutes. And this isn't requiring a lot of statistical analysis. This is the frontline workers can actually pick these points and do this on a chart and actually run the test and, and look at what the yields are and find out which combination gives you the best value. So the, again, response surface methods is, is following the direction of the best values. Uh, so, so let me get back there one second. Uh, this required four data points for each new cell. So four cells required 16 data points. So, so an easier approach on that is response service method using simplex. Again, for no interactive effects. So simplex is a little different. So on here, let's say we have 83% yield for 560 degree temperature for 60 minutes. <coughs> and uh, we put a triangle over here. So we went uh, 10 higher and 10 lower. And we also went plus or minus five. So we look at what the values at these points are. And when we look at all of these, the lowest value is here is 82%. So we swing away from that point and we reuse these two points. So we don't have to take new values. We don't have to measure this new value here, 86%. It's only one data point for each new cell. So now we look at those and we see that 85% is the lowest value. So we swing away from that. We reuse these values and the new value was 89%. We look at these again, we find that the lowest one is 86%. So we swing away, take the new measurement, that's 92. Uh, look at these again, 87 is the low. So we swing away from the low and we do this, 86 is down here. Well, guess what? Uh, that's the lowest one. So you're not gonna flip back because you know that's not gonna work. So when you look at this, okay, out of these, 92% was, was the highest one. So that basically sets your new parameters at 590 degrees C for 55 minutes. So that's using the uh, simplex method. So in summary, just to show in summary of the, of the general uh, Shannon methods is we do the uh, is is not comparative analysis, what is true, okay? And from that we go and we say, uh, where is the issue occurring? So multivariate analysis and concentration charts. And from that, we come down and we say, can the unit be disassembled? Yes or no. If it can be disassembled, if we use the component search. Uh, if it can't, we use the paired comparison, okay? Uh, so we do these tests, then we say, are there more than four factors involved? If there's more than four factors, we use variable search. If there are oh, four factors or less, we can use the full factorial DOE. Now, after that, we say, are interactive effects occurring? Is it a single uh, uh, cause or is it a combination of causes? If it's a, uh, a combination, if there are interactive effects, we use the response surface method. If it's not, we use the uh, tolerance parallelogram. And then we could go and use the, uh, the, the, the Tukey test, the B versus C uh, comparison again, to confirm that the uh, improvement actually is uh, an improvement. Now, we have a little time, I can show this. Uh, so in, instead of doing uh, control charting, Shannon uh, uh, came up with a, with a better method that was called pre-control charts. It's a simpler method which uses fewer sample sizes. And, uh, and again, Keki get a comparison between control charts and, and pre-controls over here as well. So, so what we do on pre-control charts is we take the distribution here, okay, th plus or minus three sigma. And we break it into these zones. So beyond three sigma plus and beyond mine is the red zone. Uh, we split the three sigma in half at one and a half sigma. So between one and a half, minus one and a half and th minus three sigma is a yellow zone. Also between plus one and a half and three sigma is a yellow zone. And then in the middle section between uh, minus one and a half and plus one and a half is the green zone. So uh, which was 86% of your population occurred. So, so uh, we look at this and we say, okay, the startup rules. Uh, we were qualified to start running production when five of the samples, when we grab five samples and they fall within the green zone, okay? That allows us to start production. 
Once we're doing ongoing production, uh, we take two samples at a time. So uh, you take two samples, and if both are in the green, guess what? Continue running. Okay, you take two samples. If one is in the green and one is in the yellow, hey, still good to keep on running. If you take two samples and they are both in the yellow zone, you need to adjust it. Okay, and if you have, uh, you take two samples and you have one in the upper and the lower ye uh, yellow zones, you stop it because like, why do I have this wide of a spread? So you stop production and you find out what's going wrong. Or if you have a single one in the red, you stop production. So uh, this, this is a much simpler approach. So somebody said, you're only taking two samples. Well, how often am I sampling? Well, you, you look at the thing and you often find out how long it takes before you have stoppages. So it's the average time between stoppages and you divide that by six. So if it's like, let's say it was uh, five, uh, let's say six hours between stoppages, uh, you would then, you'd sample like once an hour. Okay, so that's how you come up with your, with your uh, sampling. Uh, you know, frequency. Uh, last thing I want to get into is uh, ASQ 2012 presentation out in Anaheim. Uh, I presented Lloyd root cause pattern diagrams. This is based on Shane and methods. Uh, basically, it, it, you're looking at uh, patterns in the data. Uh, I, I started doing this at Motorola where we plotted the lines and then working for the New York Times I started using graphical uh, depth representation by looking at the data cells themselves by conditionally color formatting them. And I further that when I went to Johnson and Johnson is director of design excellence there, I, I started uh, uh, instead of, instead of uh, plotting the values, I started coloring the cells and I had a reference cell that I, that I tied them all to and I could dial the cell. And it was like the uh, sonar operator in Red October as I started changing the value in the cell, all these patterns started jumping off of the page. And they're like, what, what the hell's going on? And uh, come to find out, the patterns would actually tell you what the root causes was. Now, first you have to filter this. So you'd, you'd filter this for, by your uh, failure codes or by your complaint codes. And, and then you could then uh, use your, your, your failure rate data and you could, you could dial your failure rates and these patterns start, start occurring. And so, so, uh, so I started, uh, when I started seeing all these, I started putting them together in patterns because there were different uh, combinations. So uh, these were step functions here. These were isolated events and these were repeating events. Uh, and then you also had this combination here where these, the horizontal ones were related to month of manufacture. Vertical ones were, were related to time and field. And the diagonal ones were related, uh, they, they were, went across all months of manufacture. So they were independent of, uh, <clears throat> well, let me just explain this. If you're looking at a pattern like this, where it says a ship, uh, this is a change in design or material or manufacturing process settings, where you went from here and all of a sudden you got, uh, good, could go the other way around as well. Uh, this one, when you have an isolated line, that's either a lot related material or a temporary process settings, or this one's uncommon. This is when you're uh, doing seasonal issue related to the supplier or manufacturing process. Uh, this, this one isn't that common. Over here is time and field. So typically this is a wear out. You go so long in the field and all of a sudden the thing starts wearing out uh, after X number of months. Uh, this is another one. This is when you have uh, your complaints and, and failures coming early. Uh, this is infant mortality. So it could be early life issues or it could be instructional deficiencies where you haven't explained to the customer how to actually operate the product, so you get a lot of complaints at first. And these ones are time-related, so administrative process change, such as changing a failure code definition. So this is where management makes changes. You'll see a step function like this. You can also see an isolated uh, uh, function like this, where you have external uh, issues with consumables. So if you had a radio, it could be related to batteries that go into the radio. Or I worked in the insulin infusion pump uh, business, with Johnson and Johnson, and these type of problems would be related to the insulin cartridges that go into our product. And this one here is typical seasonality. So this would be the summer of uh, uh, 2010 and the summer of 2011. So this is repeating seasonality. Uh, so if you want any more information on this, uh, you can you can go to my uh, 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 I don't have it here. Uh, it's lcgadvantage.com. So anyway, so that basically comes to the end of our, our presentation. So we still have time for questions. 
Thank you, Bob. Yes, we do. And and uh, can you repeat that, what you just said? The LCGAdvantage.com is that what you said was the yeah uh, Lloyd, Lloyd website? Consulting, yeah, LCG Lloyd Consult LCG Lloyd Consulting Group LCG Advantage dot com. So LCG Advantage dot com, and I have uh, there's a whole lot of things I explain on that website, but one of them is a, a page for data mining. And it has a lot more on, on this. And it also has a copy of my 2012 ASQ uh, World Conference presentation there as well. I've got a question here from Susan. She, she talks about, she says, uh, methods work for uh, discrete parts and assemblies. What about chemicals, food, and beverage? How does this uh, apply there? Yeah, good question. Uh, actually, I think there are applications where they view Shane and for that. Uh, I'd have to, I, I haven't worked in that field, so I, I can't. Uh, vouch for it, but but I think that that they have used it. Yeah, go ahead, Tommy. Hey, Bob. Thanks for for your sharing. Question about uh, designing a process. Are there any processes that are actually designed with the Shannon methods in view, or is Shannon really brought to an existing? No, process? no, 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 no. I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned that because I think usually on the larger presentation I can go on this, but I, you know, I was cramming it in, <laughs> especially since we first the ten first ten minutes in, into. Uh, uh, housekeeping. So, yeah, um, that tolerance parallelogram uh, can be used while you're doing design work. Okay, because remember how when we did the tolerance parallelogram, you saw how that resistor value impacted your your speaker dB output. So, so, so if you were doing like some like uh, uh, pilot runs and stuff like that, you could you could possibly run some experiments and use the parallelogram because uh, it only thirty you only needed thirty samples to do the parallelogram. Uh, so you could actually, uh, I, I spent most of 13 years at Motorola. I was, I was in charge of new product development. So before I took over reliability, so I know where you're coming from. Yeah. So yeah, you, you, you can actually use that. And, and also um, uh, you can do also uh, a DOE for doing uh, accelerated life testing or other type of testing of products as well. Great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah.